everyone, and thanks for uh, giving me a few minutes of your busy day. I really appreciate it. So uh, I see a lot of new faces. Can you hear all right? Everybody can hear okay? Yeah. So um, my name is Sharif Abdu. I'm an interest by training, and uh, the way I like to introduce myself is that I was professionally born and raised in Vegas. I did my residency here. In, uh, in the University of UMC and stayed in practice. Um, here we go, 33 years later. So, um, since we, we have so many young faces, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of background and history about healthcare in Las Vegas. When, when I graduated, actually, when I was a resident, they, they, they told us that Las Vegas is going to be the last safe haven of fee for service. So don't try it. Uh, managed care and, and uh, any any other uh, capitation or, or, or any other form of pain is just not going to survive. It's not going to uh, do well in Vegas. So when I was first year resident, um, they brought a uh, Jim Christensen, what was the acting uh, program director at the time. They brought a healthcare economist that told us how fragmented and broken the healthcare system, the most expensive healthcare system in the world, double the second country, which is Japan, and we rank number 37 in, in, in quality in, in the top 100 uh, industrialized country. And he, 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 he drew a very doom and doom picture Medicare will be bankrupt in, uh, in, in by 2030 and, and so forth. Then he reached out in his pocket, pointed the, the audience, because all a bunch of doctors, and says, only you can fix it. So, call it ego, call it delusion, I thought he was pointing at me. <laughs> so I went up to him and said, okay, I'm in, what do we do? So he said, I'm like, look, I, I got a flight in 45 minutes. I said, I'll take you to the airport. So I took him to the airport. Fast forward, four and a half hours later, we're sitting in the bar at the airport, drawing pictures on, on the napkins about this population health management, global budgeting, risk sharing from the, uh, but now, nowadays called value-based contracting. It, it had no names back then. Uh, so, I went to uh, every hospital system in town to talk to them about possibly doing something like this, uh, opening clinics and only doing global budgeting or capitation. I got left out of the buildings in, in, in all the hospitals except the Desert Springs Hospital. Steve Peterson, uh, he, he's the only one that looked at it and said, Looks crazy, but let's do it. <laughs> so, so we opened the first Desert Spring Primary Care Clinic at Rainbow and Sahara in 1994. And we only took capitated lines. But back then it was FHP East and FHP West. And since then, I've never practiced in, in people service. I'm, I'm one of the, you know, Unicorns that never practiced fee for service. I don't know what that looked like. I don't know. We did not have any uh, significant patient other than the regular Medicare and the fee for service since I started practicing. So, 97, we, we thought about the inpatient services and how fragmented it is. So, we created what now they call hospitals. Back then, there, the word hospitals was not known. So. We signed our first contract with uh, Pacific Care July 1st, 1997, where we took all their population and management, and we called it inpatient primary care services. And, uh, and then 1997, 98, Pacific Care was about to get out of town because of uh, the losses they incurred with FBA and their partners and FICOR. And, Bruce Wiggins and, and UHS 
stepped up and we formed a Southern Nevada Healthcare System, which was UHS, the IPA, and our practices back then called Summit Medical Group. So um, we were called managed care whores and you're never going to go anywhere and, uh, and this, this model is going gonna, is gonna to die and, and, and so forth. So fast forward 20 some years later, Las Vegas is the leading by percentage of any metropolitan area in value-based contracting. So transforming healthcare is possible, even for by a little kid that come from a small town in Egypt with the, with the big dreams. Uh, I witnessed the town today. It's very hard for you to, uh, to find a larger practice that would contract on a fee for service between Optum and Inter Intermountain and P3 and, and, uh, and Kano and, and Centerwell and, 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 and so forth. Uh, every major physician group uh, are contracting in value based and, and population health. So let's talk about that for, for a minute. It's, uh, what's the landscape going to look like? So. The market has shifted from focus on the, on the hospitals and, and the inpatient to the outpatient services and the, uh, the physician group and physician group networks. Um, I mean, if, you, if you've seen the last few big deals in the, in, in the market, CVS buying signify not only the outpatient and, and, and primary care, but even home services. As well, so the the uh, the market is shifting away from bricks and mortar and big buildings and what have you to meeting the, the, the patients where they are, whether being at home or in in, uh, in the office. So um, there are three models of population health management. There is a model of building a clinic, hiring physician or physician assistant or nurse practitioner and waiting for the patient to cross the street from the other practices to your practice. It's expensive model, it's long term, but it's doable and it's uh, 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 it takes a while to, to build the practice this way, but the village MD is getting into it and uh, Oak Street is getting into it, Kano is getting into it and, and, and Center World as well. Uh, there is a second model, which is an acquisition and, and accumulation, which is pretty much every, everybody kind of dabble into that space, but um, you, you can see Intermountain acquired healthcare partners, Optum acquired a lot of practices, and so is Village MD and, and uh, Kano as well. And the third model, which this is what we focused on, which is the affiliated model, which basically says we're not going to disrupt the patient-doctor relationship, well, but we're going to enhance it and empower it a little bit. So we create uh, teams, tools, and technology around the existing practices and the patients and, and create a, a care manager and a care coordinator and a care navigator and even a pharmacist and a social worker to empower and enhance and improve that relationship. And everybody talk about value-based contracting and population health management. And a lot of people not sure what that means, but let me simplify for you. So in a population health management, you're responsible on the health and the quality and the cost of said population. Whether this population is geography, whether this population is contract managed care, whether this population is certain disease group, but you're responsible in the health and you make your living out of improving the health of this population. You don't get paid because you just see them. You don't get paid because they're sick. 
you get paid if their health improved. So a diabetic with a hemoglobin A1C, if it's run nine or above, you're not getting anywhere. It's till you control that to seven or below, you actually start realizing some savings and share sharing that savings. So that, that is the value based. Um, with the entrance of a lot of private equity and venture capitals and investors in the space, people get confused where you create the value and who gets the value. Uh, what's unique about E3 and, 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 and other, uh, and, and Kano and, and other groups, that are physician led. We only focus on the patients. So only when you create value for the patient do you really win and you really establish your presence. Not value for the investors and the shareholders and, 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 and even yourself as a, as a provider. You have to focus it every morning about improving the value for the patient by improving the health outcome and the clinical outcomes and the, the cost will follow. I remember one of the most controversial statements that I've made in my life was, I think it was Desert Spring uh, board uh, meeting one time, when I said the most accurate indicator of quality of care is its cost. The lower the cost, the higher the quality is. And people just like, oh, are you crazy? In the four season you go, you pay more, and the Mercedes you pay more. It's like everywhere is the same except in healthcare because just imagine if you go in for a, a bypass surgery and you do it in and out in a couple of days and, and you do well and you're out, that's the low cost. If you stay in, you get an infection, you get uh, immune failure, you go on dialysis for uh, a couple of days, you go on the vent for a couple of days, and you walk out with a million dollar bill. That's poor quality. That's not a good quality. So fi finally, the world had realized that the most accurate indicator of quality of care is reduction in its cost. The most accurate. I mean, it's not the only, but the most accurate indicator for, for quality of care is its cost. That's why the global budgeting or the risk or the capitation is the way to work because if you, if you improve the health, the cost will go down and you'll get a savings. There is no way to create sustainable savings in the capitation without improving the health of the patients. If you're doing it as long as I have done, you cannot reduce it by denying care, you cannot reduce it by delaying care, you, can, you cannot because it will catch up with you. If somebody needs an MRI today and you don't do it today, uh, it will cost you 10 times that uh, weeks from now. So, <clears throat> finally, um, let me do some prediction about what's the next big thing in, in, in Las Vegas or in Clark County. So, the world is shaking post pandemic and, uh, and, and the shifting. And, and the focus on the ambulatory and the outpatient services. I think that the, the, the next big thing that Las Vegas needs and wants and will get is a highly integrated system of care. The, the, uh, the separation between the, the inpatient and the outpatient, and even the hospitalist movement, which is I, I was part of, it, it has not served its purpose of, of building that connections. So a clinically integrated system of care that only the largest metropolitan area in the United States that does not have an integrated system of care is Las Vegas. So despite the transformation that we've seen into value-based, still the hospital is sitting in one corner and physician is sitting in others and everybody else is playing in the middle. So, um, when Intermountain came in town, everybody thought, okay, take a deep breath, uh, the integrated system of care is over here to stay. But unfortunately, the first thing they did is put their sign on the Raiders uh, Stadium. So, they, they, they didn't focus on building that integrated system of care, but rather is, is, is dragging referral and, and whatever it is into, uh, back home. So, it's a little bit disappointing, but 
I'm still hoping hopes that the next good thing would be some clinic and great system of care with the uh, with, with the hospital system and larger physician network that will produce a co cohesive, coherent, outstanding experience for the patients where they don't have to go wander between one specialist and another, don't have to refill the the, uh, the, the insurance information and the demographics and, and the past medical history and the social history, you know, 10 times. Every time you go to a different doctors, they don't talk to each other, they don't connect. Uh, each other and, and so forth. So, what what's unique about an integrated uh, system of care that you're allowed to share that information in one platform because you're, you're under that system. In any other system, I cannot get the hospital and my patient information in advance unless or the, the, the safe harbor or the exemption is clinically integrated system of care. So. Uh, let me pause here and just kind of get people to engage in, in the conversation. And so, any questions? Yes, sir. Dr. Pokeroy. Thank you very much. Um, can you address something that's been going on in Israel for some years now? And that's um, uh, a virtual hospital which has started at Tel which is the biggest hospital in the Middle East. A virtual hospital means it includes obviously telemedicine. And you cannot do orthopedic surgery with telemedicine, but we can do a lot of things. We can now do this, I mean, do telemedicine with lots of dialysis patients instead of slipping from, from uh, a ramp or, or outside. We can do this on, on you know, in a much easier way, and, and I think Jessica has been doing it for at least five years now. So could you address that aspect of saving? And so the second thing I want to ask you, a professor of medicine many years ago, I was at a meeting in Hawaii, and he suggested that um, if the physician gives a patient an email and access to the telephone, they can save a lot, a lot of trouble for everyone, both for themselves and for the patient, with a cap. Sure, no, I appreciate that. So, uh, it will probably be a mistake uh, uh, for me to address that virtual hospital and we have hospital experts here. So, Carla, you want to address with the virtual <laughs> hospital? Are you going to go? Sure. Um, <laughs> um, the concept that I think you're going to probably see first in Las Vegas is a concept called hospital and home, um, where you actually take the hospital services to the patient in their home, and obviously you can't do surgery, you can't do um, extensive procedures, but you can monitor patients, and so it's a it's a it's a good method for patients who um, don't need those types of procedures, but can perhaps have either or you can actually put a caregiver in the home at the bedside. So I think you're going to probably see that first, where the caregiver is actually in the home, um, before we move to completely virtual, where um, there's just monitor set up in the home. We actually have some of that today. Um, there's some CHF monitoring that can be done remotely um, or virtually. Um, but I think that to go completely virtual, I think Yes, ma'am. If I may ask you that, how many of you are familiar with EP3? EP3 is a program called Pioneer by Medicare, actually, where patients of what they call 911, instead of being taken directly to the emergency room, there's a program where ambulance companies would 
go to the patient's home and respond to the 911 call. And they do treatment, they, they do triage, treatment in place, and then transport. And the transportation doesn't have to be at the next ER if the patient is not sick enough to deserve to be in an ER. Um, the transportation could be at an alternative destination, and that could be the patient's physician office. It could be a quick care, it could be many things. Telemedicine is also part of that. So the EMTs that are arriving to the 911 call, they are set up with telemedicine um, element. It could be a cell phone. Usually we try to use the cell phone, the patient's cell phone. This way we can separate if there's no need for the EMT to stay there. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so clearly, the world is moving towards the virtual with the technology advances and improvement and at home. And like Carla said, the hospitals at home with the, with the system of the virtual monitoring or technology capability. Um, if you look at where the investment has been in the last six months, nine months, maybe even longer, a little bit longer, is in, in home health services. And who are the largest home health services today in the country? It's United, it's Humana, it's Aetna, it's CBS. So clearly, uh, they agree with Dr. Pokroy that the, the, the virtual and, and the in-home services is what's gonna dominate the, the, the next generation as a baby boomer age and, and then Gen X and, 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 uh, and a millennium. They, they don't want to go to the doctor's office and sit for 45 minutes, which is not going to happen. And they don't, go, they don't want to go to the hospital for our patient procedures and be told to come two hours earlier, fill those 37 pages of paper and sign here 18 times and, and so forth. So um, virtual and in-home services, hospital, wherever you, you want to indicate it, it is is the, uh, the next gen in, in healthcare transformation. And it's all focused on, if you, if you look at today, uh, if you have a big practice fee for service, you're probably not gonna be worth much. If you have a, a managed care, capitated lives, parent lives and that you serve and you show the effectiveness of managing these lives, regardless of any services, I mean, there is a big, uh, roll up for orthopedic surgeons that takes a risk and, 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 uh, and capitation on skeletal, uh, musculoskeletal disease, the entire uh, system, not just the orthopedic surgery. So the world is shifting and um, we're either gonna move with it or it's gonna go past us, but yes ma'am. is the patient experience. The patient will tell you if it's a good quality or not. Mm -hmm. if, if, if the patients feel they get the care at the time they need it, if they perceive that they within a reasonable amount of time, if the patient's called and you, you get told that it takes six to nine weeks to make a primary care appointment and it takes three months to make a, a specialist appointment, they're not gonna put up with that. So. And then when they go and they are treated like a number or, or that they're not going to stand for that. So number one in the quality of care is the patient experience. There's just no doubt about it. Number two is the clinical outcomes. It's, it's actually not that complicated. We try to make it more complicated than it is. So if you have high blood pressure and blood pressure is consistently and two readings or more of the last six months at 140 over 70 or better, that's quality of care. If you are diabetic or pre-diabetic and your home domain will see at seven or less, that's good quality of care. If it's at nine or more, that's poor quality of care. So experience and clinical outcome, and the third piece is the cost. If, if, if it takes me 
ten MRIs and three CAT scan and two PET scans and 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 whatever it is, a bunch of blood tests to make a diagnosis of flu. <clears throat> it's, it's it's a poor quality. So patient experience, clinical outcome, and cause are are the the, the way that I would describe. Yes, when you talked about the lower cost, is that what you were referring to? Say that again? You mentioned the lower cost. Is that what you were referring to? Right the total now? cost. The total? Yeah. Right. The total, not, not necessarily a unit cost that you bargain when you, you get united at 70% of Medicare so you can get more units and so forth. That's not a good quality in order, in order to really reduce the cost of care. It's the total cost of okay. care is is what mm -hmm. indicates the... Uh, so. What is the average cost per individual under the population management that, that will annually or semi-annually? Yes, sir. Dr. Bruce, I've been in Vegas since 98, practicing internal medicine and pediatrics. My question has to do with the concept of integrating healthcare. Uh, one of my biggest problems is the fact that every office has a different electronic healthcare record system. So, on my fifth one, I think, this one I see. Anyway, so the cardiologist is using e-clinicals, I'm using carry over there. Uh, the uh, nephrologist has a different system, and it's very hard to integrate and talk. The hospital has something else. Whereas when I go to a business office, 100 of them, they all have Microsoft Word for a letter or DocuSign or DocDo for electronic exchange. Is there any work being done to kind of get a uniform platform so the patient doesn't have to fill the past medical history, social history, 10 times at 10 different places in the hospital integration. Yep, a absolutely. And uh, I I've been talking with multiple hospital system, mainly one large hospital system for about 11 or 12 years, about this. It takes about 12 years to, on an average, to get through to a hospital system. But, um, so Epic, did a good job creating an outpatient and patient one one chart. I mean that they the dream state is is one chart uh, where you have one system throughout the network uh, and anybody can access that chart any at any given moment within that clinically integrated network. Um, the next big thing is there are multiple companies today that created an interoperability and, and, and integration uh, uh, software. So basically, and, and they are working with nine large, uh, I think, Athena, Epic, eClinic, Cerner, Cerner was sold to Oracle or something soon, so I, I, I don't know if they're gonna continue on that platform. Um, all scripts and, and something else. So there, there is a system, it's a little expensive, but it's doable, where you can build that interoperability. You're gonna have to toggle in and out of your EHR, but you can access the patient chart uh, wherever they are. But the, the, the dream that comes true, if we can have a one system, we call it one chart, throughout the entire system, whether it be in the ER, in the home health, in the SNF, in, uh, in home health uh, services, in the doctor's office, and in, in, inpatient in the hospitals, there is one chart for, for that patient. The promise was that IHE was supposed to be the promise, uh, and it, unfortunately it's, it's not well formed. It's still technology is available for, but make no mistakes. The big uh, health insurance and health systems are fighting this because they don't want to uh, fully integrate throughout. That's the, that's the, the, the reality. Everybody wants to protect this information, and to some extent, because of the cybersecurity, and you, you if you have one big huge network, you have about three hundred or three thousand, depends on how large your network is, a point of attack that can breach the system. So I, I understand the, the, the concern about the security, 
but the solution, the future, as we move into the virtual world, uh, it's going to be one job. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Look, EMR is, is like the hospitals movement and a great promise that's going to improve quality, reduce the time, uh, blah, 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 blah. Did none of that. It's actually, it, on average, the EMR cost the, uh, the, the physician doctor uh, visit to be about 13 and a half minutes more than the average before because you have to type in, you have to log in, and you have to uh, click in a separate tab to look back order, and a separate tab to go to diagnostic and uh, retrieve and, and, and so forth. So, um, if any of, 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 of us here are uh, practicing physicians, let me just uh, give you the punchline. They all suck. The <laughs> EMR just sucks. So, get the most, uh, common one, that one that can integrate with others and, and so forth, because there is nothing unique. They're going to come and tell you the sales, you click here, and it's fast. It's not. It's going to take more time, it's going to take time away from, from the patients, and it's clunky and, and, and it's slow. So might as well use the one. So everybody, like the hospital is Cerner, and everybody's like, oh my God, it's not great for our patient. So what? Uh, it, 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 none of them is great. So, so might as well have a system that integrated with the hospital where your patients have access to their information without having to wait in the time of need in the emergency room where the ER doctors and the staff are waiting for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour for someone to sign a consent and fax the, uh, the, 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 uh, the chart and, and so forth. Um, the more integrated we are, the better uh, I'm telling you, the next big thing is clinically integrated system of care that include the technology and the care management and disease management and, and meeting the patients at home. Yes, sir. Uh, well, I just you spoke and you did a presentation on the Medicare for all. And so it pointed out in that the direct beneficiaries, being the patients, being the providers, even being the payers, and almost every Access to care, research and development, it opened it to the barriers down and opened up everything. Is that married with this somehow or another? Absolutely. So, so the thing is about Medicare for All is a universal coverage and some sort of creating standardized process. We start, we try to standardize everything. Trust me, or, or, or you know, the, the banking system, till they standardize their ATM and their processes and whatever it is, we're, we're all fighting together. So we create a standardized process across health insurance and you know, you, you go work with Itman is a, a list of prior auth and a process to uh, submit your claims that's different than if it's United, that's different than it's Unana, I, I don't get it. So the, the point of the Medicare for all is using the Medicare as a financial instrument, but my bias uh, for, for a lot of reasons is to create a Medicare Advantage for all. So you, 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 you are covered by a standardized set of, of financial instruments, but then the management goes to the health plans and the private sectors to, uh, to do that. So it, it becomes the best of both worlds. Everybody's covered and uh, uh, private sectors and that more efficient and more effective can, can, can manage the, uh, and look, uh, it's all going to look the same very soon because, so 50% of Medicare beneficiary have chosen, 48 point something percent, have chosen Medicare Advantage. 
and over 50% of the regular Medicare patient or beneficiary have chosen or joined an ACO, uh, which is moving to uh, uh, a global risk and a, and a narrow network and, and, and so forth. So basically 75% of Medicare beneficiary today are under some sort of managed uh, protocol, whether being a, a regular Medicare or Medicaid Advantage. So uh, it, it's important to, uh, to look at all the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the private sectors that are innovative into virtual hospitals and in-home hospitals and in-home in service and so forth. Uh, the big government is not going to be able to do that. What should I ask you is been here forever as I have. And show that like you didn't show. How proud are you as to what kind of progress we're making? I mean, there's so much that indicates that we're still not leveling out so that people are heading for now Harry Reed Air Force to get care. I would have thought by this time we would have been able to uh, address the air. So are we making enough progress to satisfy your expectations? Hello, doctor. How are you? Nice to see you. Um, look, we never make as much progress as we'd like to, but from the time that my family moved here in 63 um, to where we are now, I think we've made extraordinary strides, not only in healthcare, but this is becoming a very mature community, and it's, it's lovely to see. We're not that transient place that my parents drove into, where a real life city. We've made a lot of progress, and, and uh, let me tell you, I'm very proud. I had two surgeries, I had two surgeries, and here one at Desert Spring and one at, uh, at Siena. The, the outpatient, uh, I think Carla was, was, uh, was at Desert Spring at the time, and I had the, uh, the, the surgery as outpatient. It's a laminectomy. She said, like, stay, we're not going to charge you more. Or so, <laughs> so uh, it was Dr. Derek Duke. And I had, I, had, I had the same thing, but I had a, a neck fusion, cervical fusion, in and out. In two hours, 48 minutes from the minute that I got out of the car to when I got back in the car. Okay. So, uh, so we actually started protocol with Derek Duke back then is to start doing spinal surgery and, and laminectomy as our patient in, in the ambulatory surgery center. So um, when my dad, God bless his soul, uh, had his heart problem, I brought him to the Springs Hospital, he had his surgery and was out in two and a half days. And um, he, he lived 15, 17 years after that. So as far as quality of care goes, um, I think, I think we're making progress. What we're lacking is a systemic integrated. That, like I said, the largest metropolitan area that does not have a clinically integrated system of care. Uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, there are two uh, large integrated systems of care. In Santa Fe, New Mexico, there are two large integrated system of care health system. Uh, so that's the next big thing, just hang on. It's Diane Gregory, she gave me my first job. Uh, she called me Miguel Bernal. Yes. Was, uh, yes, he was our, our first venture into primary care when I was at Desert Springs, and I can tell you it's, uh, it's been a pleasure working with him. And uh, can I just tell that one story about him, Steve Peterson? Please. It's quick. Um, we were negotiating with, with the master here, and um, we were trying to discuss his contract and what we were going to offer him. And, um, Mr. Peterson handed him the contract, which he had never seen before. He opened it up, he signed it, threw it back on his desk, and said, now let's negotiate. And uh, that's a true story, and uh, kind of indicative of what he has stood for his whole career, and that's relationships, and having that type of relationship with your colleagues, with your partners, with your employers, that's what makes healthcare successful, and he was very successful. And his first patient he saw, he admitted to the hospital. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question, and thank you for that, um, you know, I've done physician recruitment, development, integration, physician marketing for 35 years in this community. And I have seen a major shift in what's happened in primary care, and the landscape of primary care has changed dramatically in the last five years with primary care physicians becoming so this 
enchanted with the paperwork and you know staffing, and it, it's become it's not only running a business, it's like trying to catch a runaway train. Mm -hmm. So they're joining the center wells, the Alpines, the Inner Mountains. They're they're selling their practices. They're being acquired, and then there's that subset of physicians that have chosen to go into concierge medicine. Can you address what your thoughts are on that and where that's going in the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the, the why is, is important in, in everything that we do. So, if you know, so they're, they're recently a practice that was sold to a large um, entity, and within days or weeks, the, the, the physicians lived to the practice and started a new practice. So, uh, so they didn't sell it because they're disenchanted and what have you, uh, they, they actually love the private practice and like I said, they just sold it and they, they left them and started a new practice. But um, we have to be, the, the, the difficulty that everybody made it on and, and something else is lack of integration. Um, look, if, if there is a large system with, with, with uh, electronic medical record, why not choose that uh, electronic medical record? But you go and, and pick something different. You want to be different than everybody. Somebody goes to Epic, I'm going to go to uh, Athena. Somebody goes to Athena, I'm going to go to e-clinic. That's wonderful, let's click, whatever it is. And you discover that it doesn't work, and you create your own misery, if you, uh, if you would. So the solution, and they're moving into a mountain and okay, and instead of well and Kano and P3 and others because they were the, people realize being a part of a system is much better than being on an island by yourself. The concierge services is is gonna is here to stay and it's consumer driven. Uh, uh, the people that can afford the, that kind of service they they can buy it and they can force the market to respond. Um, but it's a small part of it. It's, it's not going to be a mainstream, uh, but, but maybe stretch. But the mainstream will be an integrated system. I do want to make sure that you clarify what was announced in the paper regarding your enterprise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I, I missed the paper. But, uh, <laughs> Excuse me. Don't worry about it. Uh, the uh, Medicare HMO assigned group, uh, when they call for appointment, it's usually three months down the road. When, you, when you're an assigned Medicare patient, you get the appointment access next day. And with the assigned HMO assigned uh, Medicare, you're just a number. Whereas uh, un unregulated Medicare, you're VIP. <laughs> yeah, so it's not you, you it's not you, uh, just a number or your VIP, it's the, how the doctor treats the patient. Uh, so if the doctors treat the patients in the fee for service uh, better than the, 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 uh, the capitated or prepaid uh, health plans, that's on the doctor, that's not on the patient. That, that patient is not VIP and that patient is not just a number. We, we decide that and we acted this way. And, and, and the shame is on us, not on the patient. Uh, I remember. practicing and I had one of the, uh, I think it was HPM or something patients and I called the cardiology and they were captivated with HPM at the time and it was 45 year old, uh, it was these hypertensive, diabetic, hyperglycerinic with an unstable chest pain. 
So I called the cardiologist and he said, ah, I've been making an appointment, we don't have any. Uh, because we were all capitated service and they were capitated with us, so he thought we just, uh, so I'm gonna confess, I lied. I told him this is a fee for service question, as uh, Medicare and whatever it is. <laughs> And he says, send him over right now. <laughs> and, 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 and he called me an hour and a half, two hours later. He said, we, we just took him to the cath lab and opened to, uh, to arteries and it was uh, live. So, is that the patient? Is that the patient who's just on board or, or a VIP? So, look, till we get out of our own way and till we wake up every morning and think it's an absolute privilege and honor to be invited on these people's lives at the time of need. We will continue to look at the world in our own lenses of the ID and the numbers. But if, if, I, if I go to the, the clinic in my office every day thinking that it's absolutely a privilege and honor to be invited by these people in their, in their time of needs, you're at it, you're never going to treat one patient as a VIP and another as just a member. You're never going to do that. You're never going to see it that way because it's not. It's the lens that we put on that make the world pink. The world is not pink. There's altruistic, but in reality, this happens. I changed from Medicare Advantage to regular Medicare because of that. So, what's the quality metrics? on regular Medicare. Nobody knows because nobody measured it. But every health plan in Medicare Advantage can tell you what their star rating is. And every Medicare health plan, they can tell you what their quality indicator is. And they will tell you what the uh, utilization metrics is. In a regular Medicare, nobody, nobody counts. Nobody, nobody knows. And the same thing with the commercial insurance. And the PPO, they don't get certified by NCQA. So nobody knows what their quality and their metrics and, uh, and, uh, and, and whatever it is. But in the HMO, they, get, they have to be certified by NCQA and they have to report their quality and indicator, they have to report their utilization, they have to report the uh, readmission rates and, and so forth. So I think the world is shifting, Dr. Chandraj, that's why 50% of the patient chose a Medicaid Advantage, and 50% of the, of the other 50% are in ACO regulated managed uh, because people realize they actually receive better care and, and, uh, and the specialists better wake up and, and smell the roses and start catching that, that this is where the world is going. So. I don't want to take too much of, of your yeah. time. Any Bruce, did you call me and told me about the great announcement we do? <laughs> so, uh, okay. And Alex, this press release, I just copied. We, 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 re we recently expanded our relationship here in town with Humana. Uh, the, the thought was Humana was always going to be exclusive with the healthcare partner, or Mountain IHC, or what have you. but. Uh, I think they finally opened their eyes and realized that there is a better, faster, more cost-effective way of treating the patients and who are now part of their network and working to, to grow with them as well. And, uh, so, again, thank you very much for giving me a few minutes of your busy day. <laughs> well, that's it. We've uh, held here a long time. I'm going to go move my car and you'll go to work. <laughs> <laughs>